an aerial view of some of the worst rioting in East Belfast in many years. These exclusive pictures, not seen until now, were taken from a police helicopter as the violence unfolded. But exactly what happened? And how did this mayhem start? We've pieced together a detailed breakdown of two consecutive nights of trouble to understand what went on on the streets of Belfast just over a week ago. East Belfast is predominantly unionist, but also home to the nationalist enclave of Short Strand. Here, there's a notorious interface where peace lines divide the two communities. The first telltale sign that violence would erupt came at six o'clock last Monday, when a senior Republican received a call on his mobile from a loyalist intermediary, warning tensions were high. UVF men were being brought into the area from across East Belfast, and by 8 o'clock were gathering at local bars. Around 8.45 p.m., groups of UVF men emerge from up here at Castle Ray Street and over at the Mount. They converge here on Albert Bridge Road. They're dressed in black, wearing surgical gloves and masks, and they're ready to attack. A passing police patrol spotted a 100-strong crowd and called for backup. The first report we had of this was by a security patrol. So we then got uh, some uh, significant disorder in that area. As officers wait for reinforcements, the Loyalist mob launches the first of a series of attacks, throwing bricks, bottles and stones at these homes. At exactly the same time, another Loyalist gang attacked Short Strand from the Newton Arch Road end at Bryson Street and hurled petrol bombs and fireworks at homes. Back at the other end of Short Strand at Mount Pottinger Road, police brought the trouble under control by 10 o'clock. But as the violence was quelled there, it intensified on the Lower Newton Arch Road. A riot now erupts as nationalists in the Short Strand area attack these homes on the Protestant Newton Arch Road. Police now estimate there are around 500 people on either side of this divide, launching petrol bombs and missiles at each other. For the next three and a half hours, the riot raged. Five shots were then fired from the Loyalist side, some ricocheting off police Land Rovers. At five to midnight, fire also came from Short Strand. A short time later, a man was shot on the Loyalist side. And shortly after, a 16-year-old was hit too. But police managed to hold the line on the Newton Arch Road and the crowds dispersed at 2.30 in the morning. One of the worst nights of rioting in recent years had ended. The next day, police were asked to clear up some of the confusion. They couldn't have been more categorical. East Belfast UVF started and orchestrated the violence. They also now admit they didn't see it coming. I think the fact of the matter is, uh, while we knew tensions were high, within that area, and we did have additional resources and additional patrols in that area, we didn't know that it was coming to this scale or this degree. The first our people knew of it was masked and gloved men coming out of the mount, uh, and clearly that was a gap in our information gathering, our intelligence gathering. Uh, that happened. Sean Murray is a senior Republican and former IRA prisoner who works across the peace lines with loyalists. He says where once there was communication with East Belfast UVF, it is now broken down. I think it started with uh, the emergence of some new young faces. Um, East Belfast was exemplary uh, before that in terms of contact and communication and people being responsive to situations on the ground. And our concern was maybe these people uh, want to make a name for themselves, want to flex their muscles. And there is evidence that the UVF has been making its presence felt on the streets of East Belfast. You've had new murals painted, which send out a UVF war message rather than a UVF peace message. Look at the number of uh, UVF flags uh, that are now being uh, displayed across East Belfast. And you have a leader of that organisation in the east of the city who sees himself as a law unto himself. On the second night of disorder last week, the UVF stepped back and watched as local youths carried on the violence that the UVF has started on the Newton Arch Road. 
in my belief, it got beyond the reach and control of those who were potentially organising that. What there was also clearly was no visible sign at that night of more mature heads or influencing hands seeking to constrain that. It was just letting it happen. So I think the beginning of this was organised. After that, it took a life of its own. But just as big a concern was that the violence had led to Republicans firing shots and brought hundreds of riders onto the streets in the middle of the marching season. The repercussions were potentially huge. Reluctant to leave the stage for dissidents to exploit, senior mainstream Republicans bust reinforcements from across the city into Short Strand to defend the area by hand. Republicans then had to go into Short Strand to shore up the area. You Why? Had to go in and, and, and have a presence and give reassurance to people on the ground. Because you leave a vacuum, other people will attempt to fill that vacuum. And we all know there are people within our communities, Republican communities, who would use this as a pretext for you know, entering into a scenario like that and trying to present themselves as defenders of the area. And in fact, it allowed the sectarian genie to come out of the battle. And once it's out of the battle, it's very, very difficult to put it back in again. The exclusive aerial footage has revealed loyalist crowds near the Newton Arge Road emptying a bottle bank to make more petrol bombs. At one stage, loyalists aimed a laser at the police helicopter. And the aerial pictures also reveal how nationalists climbed onto the roofs to lob their missiles towards the Newton Arge Road. On the second night of trouble, a press photographer was injured when shots were fired. Police say they came from dissidents. The situation was one of chaos. Here at a centre for community mediation in North Belfast the next day, representatives of what was the IRA and what is the UDA, UVF and Red Hand Commando met face to face. Sean Murray was at the talks. It was tense. I think as the meeting went on, the maturity came to the fore and then I think there was leadership shown by, by both perspectives uh, in terms of saying, look, we are where we are. Um, there's an acknowledgement of what happened who is responsible now. Where do we go from here? A deal was done to end the violence. Stewards from both sides would work to restore calm on the Wednesday night. But why did the UVF attack the Short Strand Enclave? Many explanations have been put forward in the last week that some loyalists feel disadvantaged and that the peace process has passed them by. Previous riots were sparked in North Belfast eight months ago by a belief that the historical inquiries team, the HET, is one-sided and concern that a so-called supergrass trial could affect the UVF leadership. You can put all of that into the pot, you can stir it up to make whatever you want out of it. But I think there will be people who will say that what happened uh, those few days ago were about an individual, uh, about one person, not about the community, and not about any of those genuine grievances that exist out there. We did try to talk directly to that individual, the leader of the UVF in East Belfast, but he didn't want to talk to us. But the East Belfast UVF has been talking recently to this local clergyman, Reverend Mervyn Gibson. Have the UVF in this area said to you why it happened? Well, they have plainly said to me, and they've said to others as well. It happened because they felt their community was continually under attack. They had put forward some solutions how this could be resolved. They looked to the police to try and resolve it. They looked to the Republican community to try to resolve it. But it wasn't being resolved. Houses were continually attacked, and I believe that's why they've done it. Disturbances at the interface had escalated over the weekend immediately before the riding of last Monday and Tuesday. But whatever the exact reason, East Belfast UVF took a decision to attack the Short Strand last week. And importantly, we can now reveal that was with the full backing of the UVF Shankle Road Command. I certainly witnessed uh, a coming together, certainly of the, the Shankle and East Belfast and, and the UVF leadership in general in supporting uh, the leadership during the week, what was happening in East Belfast. In fact, last Tuesday evening, the East Belfast UVF leader is understood to have been joined on the Newton Arge Road by the overall leader of the UVF, its so-called brigadier. 
but his appearance alongside the East Belfast commander raises further questions about the UVF's commitment to peace. In 2007, they issued what was meant to be an endgame statement, and the brigade staff set a direction. Uh, they talked about moving into a non-military, civilianised role. Everything that is happening in East Belfast speaks and acts in contradiction of that leadership direction. But the violence of last week may have suited the UVF leadership. Now, some people have said that there is some thinking within the UVF that maybe if we cause a bit of noise, maybe if we cause a bit of violence, maybe if we show that we're still out there, that some of these things will back off, that the HET will back off, that the Supergrass trial will back off. That's what you get if you come after us with investigations. The UVF's volatility has been a matter of real concern for a number of months. We have learned that pipe bomb attacks on two homes in Republican West Belfast last November have also been blamed on a UVF unit, and leading Republicans have tackled the UVF leadership about this. Well, there's an organisation responsibility on the UVF to get its anger out. We give them the benefit of the doubt and hope that they will rise to the mark and deal with those situations. Uh, but time's not in their side. You know what I mean? They need to deal with it as soon as possible. The UVF's actions are a real concern for the Stormont Executive too. Last Thursday, Peter Robinson met a UVF delegation, including the East Belfast commander. The First Minister has said last week's violence has damaged Northern Ireland's reputation internationally. A senior civil servant has been appointed to report back on the issues behind it. And the police, often in the middle of community division, are also stressing the need for a local solution at the Short Strand interface itself. Policing, police is the symptoms. It, it, it's a short-term fix. There has to be a longer-term sustainable relationship between these communities. And how we do that is principally with communities being supported by other agencies, but it's in communities' hands as well. But switching the violence on is always easier than switching it off. And with a precedent having been set at Short Strand last week, there is now a fear of more trouble at other interfaces throughout the marching season. Stephen Dempster reporting. Well, sustained rioting for two nights, gunmen back on the streets, houses wrecked, thousands of pounds worth of damage caused. And the police admit there was a gap in their intelligence. I'm joined now by the Justice Minister, David Ford. Mr Ford, um, there may have been a failure of policing intelligence uh, last week and uh, Assistant Chief Constable Finlay made that clear, but there's no doubt on the police's part, very clear about this, that the UVF was responsible for turning the tap on. Why can the authorities not go into East Belfast and arrest the people responsible before they do it again? Well, that's the job for the police. It's not the job for the Department of Justice. But obviously the police have to work on the basis of evidence and intelligence which enables them to take action. What was also clear was that there was a build-up of tension with flag flying, with mural painting before we got to this stage. And there have to be questions as to how the agencies as a whole address problems like that. Um, are you concerned that there was this intelligence gap, that all of what you've just outlined was indeed happening? The benefit of hindsight, we know what it led to. But, you know, Assistant Chief Constable Finlay says, we, we didn't expect 100 men to come out of the Mount area wearing masks and surgical gloves and do what they did. Well, clearly it is a matter of concern, but that doesn't mean it's always easy to get the intelligence to deal with things in advance. What we have to do is ensure that the police have the best possible intelligence. And one key issue of that is the community contacts that they depend upon. But you, you depend on public confidence, though for policing to work properly. Mm -hmm. Can you understand that there may be people at home watching this who feel that um, policing didn't really get to grips with what happened on Monday and Tuesday of last week, that the individuals responsible, far from being arrested and called to account mm -hmm. for what they did, in fact were, were invited, some of them were invited up to Stormont Castle to parley with senior politicians? Well, I had no part in any parlaying, if that's what you describe. I certainly recognise that in the past people have been persuaded away from violence because of church leaders or community leaders. I think that's very different from people in government parlaying, as you mm. described it. But they did. Senior politicians did, did talk to yes. them. Are you uncomfortable about that? If you'd been asked for your advice, would you have said maybe not a good idea? I think there are real issues that need to be addressed around community confidence. I think the real issues need to be addressed around robust policing. I am going to take an awful lot of convincing 
that really senior politicians speaking to those who are fermenting violence is the way to go forward. So did those individuals, those senior politicians who met with those uh, UVF leaders from East Belfast make a miscalculation in your view? Well, I don't know exactly who was at the meeting. I don't know what was said. I was no part of it. I took part, for example, this afternoon in a much more constructive meeting, a range of government departments looking at how we deal with difficulties around interface areas and other hard to reach areas, looking in a constructive way about engagement with positive community leadership. That's what I think government should be doing. Yeah. Mixed messaging, perhaps, one wonders. You, you're saying you're uncomfortable about it. The First Minister was at the meeting. It took place in Stormont Castle, which is the heart of yes. Northern Ireland government. Yes. And I took part in other things which were my responsibility to look at community safety issues around the interface during last week when Naomi Long took me around as MP and introduced me to some of the people there to see how we address those community safety issues, partially perhaps by physical mm. structures, but very much by community engagement. Do you feel that you're being sidelined on this? You are the Minister for Justice. Well, the Minister for Justice has a responsibility to support the justice agencies, in this case particularly the police, and through the, the community safety unit of the Department of Justice. That's what we've been doing. Other people have to take on their responsibilities because a large part of the community relations issue is something for First Minister and Deputy First Minister. Okay, just a final quick question to you. We do not have an IMC to monitor paramilitary mm -hmm. ceasefires anymore. What's the status now of the UVF ceasefire after last week's activities? Well, it's not up to me to judge that, but you heard what Alistair Finlay said. That's the briefing I've been given by the police service. The firm belief that it was the East Belfast UDA started that trouble off. And the message has to be absolutely clear. They claimed some years the ago UVF that they had gone away. Yeah. The UVF started yeah. it. Yeah. The message has to be clear. The UVF claimed that they were disbanding. The UVF has to go away. There is a role for individuals in community life if they want to take part in the democratic and community process. There is no role for organisations like the UVF is. OK, uh, we will leave it there, Mr Ford. Thank you very much you. indeed for uh, coming in to join us. So, what's it been like on the front line of the trouble? Mandy McCauley has been talking to two prominent churchmen who believe that some loyalist leaders are now engaged in a very dangerous game, exploiting sectarian tensions on community interfaces for their own financial ends. And she's been hearing the human cost from people on both sides of the peace line. For years, residents on both sides of the East Belfast interface say they've lived with the threat of violence but eight days ago, one woman, a Catholic resident of the Short Strand, too frightened to be identified, looked out of her window and was frozen with fear, horrified at what she saw. I looked out the window and got the shock of my life. What did you see? I seen hundreds of men, grown, older men, with balaclavas on, black balaclavas and um, black coats and wearing surgical gloves. I actually crawled down the stairs on my belly to get to the phone, to phone the police. I got a girl and just said to her, please help me. I thought I was going to be killed. I thought I was going to be killed. And then, minutes later, barrages of stuff beat off my windows. I was just in utter, utter panic. It was just horrendous, horrendous. She's not the only one who was terrified. Just before nine o'clock, Leontia Garland's children were playing in front of their house when missiles started exploding around them. And the court was lit then with all the fireworks and everybody had started to run, so I just grabbed them, them and with the panic they were squealing too, not realising, you know, what was going on. I think they just see me panicking then and they were squealing. The older two are very, very nervous. I mean, they haven't been out or anything because they're afraid. Across the peace line, Protestant residents say last week's violence was a response to months of attacks on their community by young nationalists, attacks which they claim have been ignored by police. One woman says her son, who's in a wheelchair and a disabled friend, were attacked on the other side of the divide on the Sunday before trouble broke out. There's not a week goes by, there's bricks, there's metal bars, there's broken bottles, three over his back, he's never been able to use his garden. 
and on Sunday there was the final straw, um, him and his friend, he's in a wheelchair, his friend came up from Banbridge for a nice weekend up in Belfast on a Kay Walker and was walking to try to get into Christopher's home and they were hit at two o'clock in the afternoon with bricks. And there's not a week's went by we haven't phoned the PSNI and they're not taking any heat. But there are those who are convinced that the UVF has decided to take advantage of this discontent to stir up trouble for its own gains. One of those who believes it is his Christian duty to speak out about the orchestration of last week's riots is a Church of Ireland minister who's lived and worked in East Belfast for more than a decade. They didn't necessarily actually physically drag hundreds of men and women and young people onto the streets, but they created an environment that they knew and everybody else knew would result in hundreds of people going onto the streets. And on the back of that, then they solved or attempted to be seen as, the, as part of the answer, a big part of the answer to the problem, and in solving the problem. He's not alone in that belief. Across the city in the loyalist heartland of the Shankill Road, the UVF has a strong presence. Pastor Jack McKee is based there. He says it's now in the financial and political interests of some paramilitaries to open up sectarian divisions. There are people who are content to stir up tensions um, so that they would come in um, as the cavalry in order to bring a solution to the issue and be seen as the good guys. My interpretation of what happened in East Belfast is that there were those who were hell-bent on put on, on a show. The presence of organised groups of adults clearly working together in a disciplined fashion shows how orchestrated the violence was. So you're saying that at some level, loyalist paramilitaries brought hundreds of grown men and youngsters onto the streets to terrorise people so that they could then be seen to be solving the problem? The paramilitaries certainly had a hand in creating the problem and encouraging the situation that happened. Uh, three days later, discussions have taken place, talks have happened, and the streets are clear tonight. There's nobody out on the streets of East Belfast this evening, for the most part. Now, why couldn't those talks have happened a week ago or a fortnight ago uh, in order to prevent the situation of the, the recent riots. And yet loyalist community workers would say, well, we've been in meeting after meeting in recent days to try and solve this problem. Well, I think I would have a question for them and it would go something like this. Uh, why didn't you attempt to solve this problem before it happened? David McClay is not saying that there were not genuine grievances but rather that there was a deliberate decision by paramilitaries to escalate the situation. A young man that we were encouraging to come away from the riots, not to stay there any longer. And uh, he whispered to myself and to another person, uh, I can't go here, I've got to stay. Uh, I'll be in trouble, I can't leave, I've got to stay. So obviously he was afraid to leave and felt he had to stay there. Presbyterian Minister the Reverend Johnson Lamb was also on the streets on Tuesday night when adult men were replaced by teenagers on the front line. These are young people living in Inner East who, um, well, rightly or wrongly believe that they're defending their, their location. They're young people who have got engaged or become engaged in all the activities of, of, of these last couple of nights, brick throwing and chanting and all manner of things. Young people like to, be, like to be in at the heart of everything. They like to say they've been there. And some of them who have been bruised, battered, even shot are, are, are wearing those, those, those badges as honour. I've been on the front line, I've been engaged, without really thinking about what they're doing. One reason why the UVF may have decided to escalate the violence is money. Some community workers have told us that they believe that what the UVF wants is a greater share of government funding, in particular a new £4 million contested space programme. Part of this money remains to be distributed by the Office of the First and Deputy First Ministers and other bodies.
Spotlight has been told that at last week's meeting between loyalists and Peter Robinson, money was not discussed, but elements of the voluntary sector remain deeply worried. Those we've spoken to fear that some of the money earmarked for loyalist communities will end up in the hands of paramilitaries, already trying to muscle in on government funding and jobs. They say that across Northern Ireland, paramilitaries are attempting to seize control of their areas in order to squeeze out community organisations who have been at the coalface of some of the most deprived loyalist areas for decades. Some have been intimidated. They say it would put themselves and their colleagues in danger if they appear on camera. Solving the problem, they're portraying themselves as those that are worthy of public funding and, and public support. Public funding, which is drying up at the moment, and public funding, which uh, lots of organisations, uh, not necessarily connected to any church, but very good organisations, uh, being run by ordinary working class women and men in East Belfast uh, won't have access to if that world has access to that funding. In March, the executive agreed to spend £80 million tackling poverty and unemployment. The Social Investment Fund has been set up to address these issues. But Jack McKee says paramilitaries will see it as offering them rich pickings. Bottom line is that they're looking to be funded. They're looking for what they see as their just reward and their fair slice of whatever funding is available from government. And they're those that say that, that there's a pot of 80 millions that's available to be divided between um, unionist and nationalist communities. Uh, and I think that there are those who, well, the, well, the, the, the belief is that there are those um, who want to make sure that they get their share of that particular pie. Jack McKee believes that decisions are being made by government that can only really be explained by a desire to protect the peace process. Why aren't politicians making these points? I think because they want the peace process to work, as we all do, but some want it to work at any price. And what is that price? If we can buy off paramilitaries and I don't mean buying off the normal volunteers, as it were, um, but those who are within the command structures, if we can buy them off, then we can keep drawing the paramilitary groups into the centre. And as long as we can keep them there, whatever it costs, we will keep them there. But the reality is that while that, to some point, is working, uh, within local communities, um, paramilitaries still control those communities. Back in East Belfast, those on the peace line are still coming to terms with the events of last week. We're sick of all this trouble every week going on in it, every couple of months in this area. Now, the men that come out the other night there, they protected the ones in the area, but what's getting me is there's children going to get involved in the trouble now. We're just surviving at the minute. We're not even living. We're existing. There's not even conversations going on. You're just sitting in nerves. You, you, you just can't relax. You can't, you can't lift the paper to read the paper. You've no concentration. You've no, you just have no life at the minute. Just no life whatsoever. That report from Mandy McCauley will join me now. In the Spotlight studio are the DUP MLA Sammy Douglas, Sinn Féin's Jerry Kelly, and churchmen, the Reverend Mervyn Gibson and the Reverend David McClay. Um, Mervyn Gibson, first of all, you were at the meeting which took place last Thursday at Stormont Castle, which involved UVF leaders from East Belfast in talks with senior politicians, among them Geoffrey Donaldson, Sammy Douglas was there, and uh, the First Minister, Peter Robinson. Do you accept David McClay's claim in that film that um, this latest violence was switched on by the UVF in East Belfast for money? No, I don't accept that argument at all. I think there's been a build-up over many months of small attacks. I think it was the lack of management of those attacks, which were managed for years, but for a variety of reasons that everybody took their eye of the ball. 
And basically there was a tax built up until we had money. Nothing justified what happened Monday night. Let me say it, nothing justified the rioting. But I definitely don't believe it was for money. So, so 100 men wearing masks and surgical gloves coming out of the Mount area to attack people in Short Strand was a reaction to provocation, you're saying? I think it was a build-up of small-level attacks or low-level attacks on the Protestant Green over many months. I spoke to women who had chisels thrown into their back gardens, wheel braces. Night after night, something coming. I suspect it's going both ways. But sadly, as a community, we all took our eyes at that ball and what happened on Monday night, everybody saw in their clip there. David Mitley, Mervyn Gibson says you've, you've got it wrong. It's a, a much simpler explanation than the one <coughs> that you have put forward. Well, obviously there was a lead up to, you know, it, it didn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, but it, it, it's clear that the, the UVF and, and the paramilitary world were, were in the middle of, of the rioting that was, that was taking place and, and that young people were, 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 were afraid to come, come away from the riots. Some did, but others were afraid to be removed by, by youth workers who went, who went down to, to, to see if they could encourage kids a, away from the scene. Um, you're absolutely clear in your mind, are you? The tap was turned on, the tap was then turned off, in both cases, by UVF leaders in East Belfast. I, I, I'm clear about this, uh, that that ordinary people in East Belfast, a lot of ordinary people in East Belfast, are hesitant to speak out uh, against the paramilitary world. The very taxi man that drove me down here this evening uh, asked what, what I was doing, what was my take on it, whenever I talked to him about what, what I was coming here to, to say, and he said, well, he, he wouldn't want those people coming to his door. Earlier this evening, uh, a guy that works in the community said to me, David, you watch yourself. Those guys will not like what you're saying. Um, well, what do you say to, to, to Mervyn Gibson and others then um, about their understanding of the situation on the ground? Do you think that Mervyn Gibson is, is ignoring the elephant in the room? You are absolutely clear, are you, uh, that, that the paramilitaries want to move into the area in places like East Belfast to access public funds, which have currently and previously gone to other organisations with lots of experience. And Are you saying he's not accepting that or he's not aware of it? First of all, let me say I'm not disagreeing with Mervyn that there was a lead up to this, you know, that, that there wasn't, uh, uh, that there isn't a bigger picture sure. that has been totally uh, not, not aired to the extent that it ought to be aired. I'm, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that East Belfast uh, has a strong paramilitary presence, that the majority of people, a lot of people certainly in East Belfast, the people that I connect with on a day-to-day -day basis, do not want to be holding their community in fear. And who have the power to take kids in their dozens and in their hundreds out onto the streets for their own ends? Uh, just this evening again at a community meeting that I was at, uh, somebody said, well, it, it is all about funding, isn't it? What? So that's the perception in the community of the people I talk to. There you are. Well, it's the people that, uh, that, that David talks to. Sure. Um, I think uh, all... Are you saying you don't hear that at all? Oh, no. What do you call it? I hear those, those, uh, those rumours as well. I hear people say that, to be honest. All I can deal with what the facts on the ground, talk to the local people, uh, what they believe well, happened in this situation. It depends who you talk to, doesn't it? It depends it who depend, talk to. And it depends who you listen to. But equally, everybody wants paramilitaries to go away. Everybody wants paramilitaries, but we're not going to wish them away. We're going to have work on paramilitaries didn't parachute into our areas. They're part of our communities. Their grannies live there, their mothers. Same in Republic communities. So we have to work, I believe, yeah. in partnership to assist them to move off the stage. Well, does, does that mean assisting them to access public funds to become community workers? Or does it, does it mean standing up to them and saying, go away, we don't support public funds going to you because we like the organisations that are currently on the ground. You're part of the problem, not part of the solution. I don't see it as them or us. As I said, they're part of the community. I sit on several committees where there's people with paramilitary backgrounds in those committees. We sit in partnership with us. They don't can't control the organisation. Yeah. But a paramilitary background is very different from a paramilitary present, isn't it? That's, that's the point. Paramilitary backgrounds are one thing. The question is, are current paramilitaries trying to extort other individuals? Are they trying to use violence for their own ends to access public funds? Because if they are, that's a very serious situation. It's totally for wrong. the communities Surely. You know, that you're trying to represent. Um, but the people will stop that. Represent. Myself, myself and David will stop that because we sit in many community organisations. And to be honest, if we've seen anybody trying to muscle in for money to go shoot the paramilitaries, I'd be the first to cry out against it. Sammy Douglas, um, it seems we've got... Uh, there, there's a bit of a nuance here um, between the two ministers' take on, on what the situation is in East Belfast. What, what is your view of, of the contribution being made by paramilitaries at the moment? Is there anything positive about it in East Belfast or is it entirely negative? Do they need to go away or they, do they need to be helped to go away? They need to go away and they need to help. 
and, and I was at that meeting the other day, and I make no at bones Stormont about Castle. at Stormont yeah. Castle. And what was promised at that um, meeting? And, and at that meeting, the, the Parmalee certainly said to us uh, they were under pressure um, fr from local communities uh, about some attacks. And the PSNI will, will, will certainly t t tell you there have been attacks on both communities over this past number of months. And, and for me, it's, it's a bit like the, um, the little foxes that spoil the vine. That, and I'm not diminishing the violence, but there's been a build-up to this. There's been a simmering, uh, simmering problems over this past number of months. But at those meetings, it was clear as a bell, they said to us, this isn't about money. And Mervyn Gibson's there, and he, and he was at that. Yeah. They said it wasn't about money, it was about safety. And for me, not safety. about... Safety, so, what, so yeah. what were they... Let, let me just what, say... Well, okay, what were say. they promised at the meeting to turn the violence off again? Because that's what happened after that meeting. What they were promised was this, that we would um, come up with some safety measures, that we would speak to the police and we would speak to other agencies to ensure that the people's um, um, houses would, would, would be fixed up, that the PSNI would have a, a, a presence on the ground, and that we would work together to ensure that the violence didn't happen. You don't now, see an irony in all of that, that these, these people who wanted safety and were promised safety at that high-powered uh, meeting at Stormont Castle were themselves responsible, uh, at least in a fairly significant way, for the violence that happened on Monday and Tuesday night. They were the ones, or their people on the ground were the ones wearing the masks and the surgical gloves, throwing the fireworks, firing the guns and throwing the petrol bombs. Yeah. Uh, and if you ask me, will UVF involved? Of course they were. But also say as well, there were Republican gunmen on the streets as well. Um, and there were communities and houses on both sides attacked. There was violence emanating from both sides. And, and certainly, I think it was a recognition within UVF that the, the violence got out of control. As, as I think Sean Murray and others said tonight, and the PSNI as well, um, I don't think any of us envisaged this. And certainly, um, we weren't um, rushing the, the situation because we were unaware of this. It took us, it took us all by shock, to be quite honest. Yeah. Uh, Jay Kelly, um, we heard from Sean Murray in that film saying that uh, the UVF leadership started it, but Republicans were very quick to bring guns out as well. And he talked uh, about a vacuum. Uh, if if uh, the situation goes unchecked, there will be a vacuum, and the danger is that will be filled by, filled by dissident Republicans. How concerned are you about that possible scenario? Well, let me deal with, it with, with a couple of things. With respect to Mervyn and, and uh, Sammy, you know, on the one hand, they're saying that uh, the reasons behind this was, uh, you know, there were uh, uh, reasons of attacks and all of that. Sammy has said that there were attacks both ways. There's been sporadic attacks, but they are sporadic and they're intermittent over a long period of time. But here's, I mean, if we're talking about facts, here's the fact, and you've seen it in your own programme. Up to two years ago, right, the, there has been a change in East Belfast, and specifically in East Belfast, where they have changed a re-image and a whole programme, which was a lot of money put into, by the way, the re-image the whole thing. Take away the paramilitary uh, um, murals. What happened? Somebody started to put the paramilitary uh, murals back up, and it's a UVF. So you can't avoid the fact that the UVF didn't come to this all of a sudden that night. They, there was a build-up to it. And, le and let me add something else to it. If you go to North Belfast, and you know the same difficulties arise there, just a couple of days before, when uh, the protests after the Tour of the North, when the, well, well, let's just, it's, it'll be very short. Okay. When the Tour of the North, it, there was a, a UVF influence there in terms of the protest, which was went the situation up, and it is not a coincidence that this is at the beginning of the marching season. Do, and you, that's accept, do you accept uh, the Reverend David McClay's point there, that this is about a certain group of paramilitary leaders wanting a share of the financial spoils in future? Do you think well, quite it's frankly, about that? Well, quite frankly, I don't know. Uh, but well, do, you, do you care? Does it matter to you if that's the case? Well, or or, or do, you accept, well, do you frankly, accept that if those individuals well, do get a piece of the funding cake, that's the price of peace? But, but, well, frankly, no, I, I don't think they should get a piece of the money. I mean, if the, there are problems in all of these working class areas. There, is a, there are issues of uh, multi-deprivation and, and, and disadvantage. And the, the uh, uh, social investment fund and the social protection fund were put there particularly by the politicians to try and deal with that. And it should be dealt with through uh, bona fide organisations in terms that I would be very, very worried. And, and, and let me make this very clear because I've said this. At the worst possible times, I have argued for talking with people who are involved in this because okay. that's the way you change it. But, but if the talks and I, if the talks in Stormont were about giving money to the UVF, then we need to know about it and it needs to be changed because that's not where government, that's not where the money for government will go, and Sinn Féin will make sure it won't okay. go. Okay, David McClay, are, are you concerned that too many people are too quick to? understand and to be empathetic with some of the individuals who caused the trouble on the streets of East Belfast on Monday and Tuesday of last week. Should they be taking a tougher line? Mervyn Gibson and, and, and Sammy Douglas. I want the paramilitary world to, to move 
to move away from their past. But they as say much, they want that too. As, as, as much as they do, and they do as much as I, as I do. Uh, but my, my argument is simply this, that the paramilitary world are not going, away from, going to move away from their past by holding their communities in fear. That's not going to win the respect or the admiration of their local communities by, by, by operating out of fear, by putting up new murals, by putting up flags on streets where there never were paramilitary flags before. Do, do, do you think that um, paramilitary leaders under any circumstances are bona fide voices for the community they claim to represent? Not if they're going to, on the one hand, hold their community in fear and on the other hand, operate uh, as community workers. If they're going to be community workers, be community workers, have, have, get the support of their communities okay. and move away from holding people in and fear. And that's the point, Mervyn Gibson, isn't it? It's one or the other. And David Matei's point other. is a simple one. You can't have both. You can't be a paramilitary and a community representative. I think that's right. There's a certain point I have to say. But the paramilitaries have a constituent. The Republicans have a constituent. Uh, people have to listen to people and talk to them. It was hard talking with the paramilitaries this week. It wasn't a matter of empathising with them or saying, tell us what you want, we'll go and get you. I think it was some hard talking. What good can be taken out of this past week is the felons were stopped pretty quickly through talking. Okay. All right. Gentlemen, we need to leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed uh, for coming into the Spotlight Studio.